Live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE. Covering IBM Chief Data Officer Strategy Summit. Brought to you by IBM. Now here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to Boston, everybody. This is theCUBE, the worldwide leader in live tech coverage. Stu Miniman and I are pleased to have Gene Kolker on, a CUBE alum, uh, he's an IBM Vice President and Chief Data Officer of the Global Technology Services Division, and Seth Dobrin, who's the Director of Digital Strategies at Monsanto. You may have seen them in the news lately. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Gene, welcome back, good to see you guys again. Thanks, thank you. So, let's start with the customer, Seth. Let's uh, tell us about what you're doing here, and then we'll get into your role. Yeah, so you know the, the CDO Summit has been going on for a couple of years now, and I've been lucky enough to be participating for Couple of a year and a half or so, um, and you know, really, the, the the nice thing about this summit is is the interaction with peers, um, and the interaction and networking um, with people who are facing similar challenges from a, a similar perspective. Yeah, it's kind of a relatively new role and, and topic, one that's evolved. Gene, we talked about this before, but so you've come from industry into uh, a non-regulated environment now. What's that been like? So I, I think the deal is that. Uh, um, uh, we were developing some approaches and we're getting some successes in a very regulated environment, right? And now um, I feel uh, with, and we were being client of IBM for years, right? Using their technologies approaches, right? So, and now I feel it's time for me personally to move on something different and try to serve our, our I mean, IBM clients, irrespective of industry. I came from healthcare, uh, but they're, you know, uh, approaches, you know, and what IBM can do for clients go across different industries, right? And doing it at scale, that's very beneficial, I think, for clients. So Monsanto, obviously, you guys do a lot of stuff in the physical world. Yep. You're the head of digital strategy. So what does that entail? What is Monsanto doing for digital? Yeah, so, um, you know, for as head of digital strategies for Monsanto, really my role is to, number one, help um, Monsanto internally reposition itself um, so that we behave and act um, like a digital company. So leveraging data and analytics. Um, and also the cultural shifts associated with um, being more digital, which is that whole, you know, kind of like you start out this conversation with the whole customer first approach. So what is the real impact to what we're doing to our customers um, and, and driving that? And then based on, on those things, how can we create new business opportunities um, for us as a company? Um, and how can we even create new adjacent markets or new revenues in adjacent areas based on technologies and, and things we already have existing within the company? So is the scope of analytics, customer engagement, uh, digital experiences, all of the above? So, so the, the scope is really looking at our portfolio across the gamut um, and, and seeing how we can better serve our customers and society. Um, leveraging what we're doing today. So it's really leveraging the reuse factor of the whole digital concept, right? So we have analytics for geospatial, right? A big part of agriculture is geospatial. Are there other adjacent areas that we could apply some of that technology and some of that learning? Can we monetize those data? Can we monetize those, the outputs of those models based on that? Or is there just a whole new way of doing business as a company um, because we're in this digital era? Seth, we, we talked about a, a lot of the companies that have CDOs today are highly regulated. Um, what are you learning from them? What's what's different kind of in your organization? You know, it might be a, an opportunity for you that, that they don't have and, you know, do you have a CDO yet or is that something you're planning on having? Yeah, so we, we don't have a CDO. Um, we do have someone who acts as a, de, essentially he's a de facto um, CD, CDO. He has all of the data organizations on his team. Um, it's very recent uh, for Monsanto. Um, and, um, and so I think, you know, in terms of from the, the regular, you know, what can we learn from, you know, there, there are, it's about half financial people, half non-financial people are in half heavily regulated industries. And I think, you know, on the surface, you would, you would think that, you know, there was not a lot of overlap. Um, but I think the level of rigor that needs to go into governance in a financial institution, um, that same thought process can really be used as a way to um, really enable more R&D, more you know, growth-centered companies to be able to use data more broadly. And so thinking of governance not as a, as a roadblock or an inhibitor, but really thinking about governance as an enabler. How does it enable us to be more agile? How does it enable us to be more innovative, right? If, if people in the company 
there's data that people can get access to via a known process of a known condition, right? Good, bad, ugly, as long as people know, they can do things more quickly because the data's there, it's available, it's curated, and if they shouldn't have access it under their current situation, what do they need to do to be able to access that data, right? So if I need, if I'm a data scientist and I wanna access data about my customers, what can, I can, what can and can't I do with that data? Number one, does it have to be de-anonymized, right? Or if I wanna access it in its current form, what steps do I need to go through and what types of approval do I need to do to, do to access that data? So it's really about removing roadblocks through governance instead of putting them in place. Gene, uh, I'm curious, you know, I, we, we've been digging into, you know, IBM has a very multifaceted role here. Um, you know, how much of this is platforms, how much of it is, you know, education and services, how much of it is, you know, being part of the data that your, your, your customers are using? <clears throat> so, I think actually there are different approaches to, to these issues. Um, my take is, is basically we need to um, think that we live in cognitive era, right? And data is a new natural resource worldwide, right? So data as a service, cognitive as a service. I think this is where you know IBM is coming from. And IBM is, um, you know, traditionally was not like that, but it's under a, a lot of transformation as we speak. So a lot of new people coming in, a lot of uh, um, um, innovation happening uh, as we speak along these lines of new times because cognitive is something really new, right? And it's just getting started. Data as a service is really new. It's just getting started. So there's a lot to do. Um, and I think um, my role specifically, uh, Global Technology Services is, you know, uh, largest by revenue uh, unit at IBM. is 30 plus billion entity, okay? And we, um, uh, support a lot of different industries, basically going across all different types of industries. How to transition from um, IT uh, offerings to new business offerings, uh, service, integrated services. I think that's the key for us. Seth, Seth I'm, I'm just curious, you know, where's Monsanto with uh, kind of the adoption of cognitive? You know, where, where are you in that journey? Um, so we are actually a fairly, um, advanced in the journey in terms of using analytics. I wouldn't say that we're using cognitive per se. Um, we do use a lot of um, uh, machine learning. Um, we have some applications that uh, on the back end run on AI. Um, so some form of artificial and, or formal artificial intelligence than machine learning. Um, we haven't really gotten into what, you know, what IBM uh, defines as cognitive in terms of systems that you can interact with um, in a natural, you know, normal course of doing you know, voice um, and, and that you spend a whole lot of time constantly teaching. Um, but we do use, like I said, artificial intelligence. So Gene, I'm interested in the organizational aspects. So uh, we had Interpol on before, he's the global CDO, you're a divisional CDO. You've got a matrix into your leadership within the, the global services division, as well as into the chief data officer for all of IBM. Okay, sounds, sounds reasonable. Um, he, uh, he laid out for us a really excellent sort of set of a framework, if you will. This is Interpol. Uh, you got to uh, understand your data strategy, identify your data sources, make those data sources trusted, and then those are sequential activities. And in parallel, um, you have to partner with the line of business, and then you got to get into the human resource planning and development piece. That has to start right away. So that's the framework, sensible framework. A lot of thought, I'm sure, went into it, and a lot of depth and meaning behind it. How does that framework translate into the division? Is it sort of a plug and play and, or is there, are there divisional goals that are, create dissonance? Can you sort of? Yeah, so basically I'm, you know, uh, only 100 plus days in, in my journey <laughs> within IBM, right? Uh, but I can tell you that global technology services is transforming itself into integrated services business, okay? So it's, uh, this framework uh, you just described is, is very applicable to this, right? So basically what we're trying to do, we're trying to become, I mean, it was uh, the case before for many industries, for many of our clients, but we want to transform it ourselves into more, I would say, trusted broker.
broker to what they need to do. And this framework help, is helping tremendously because, again, there are things we can do in uh, cons uh, you know, one after another, right? Sequential order, and things we can do in parallel. So we try those things to, to be uh, put in the agenda for our global technology services unit, okay? Um, and this is new for them uh, in, in some respects, but in some respects it's kind of what they were doing before, but with new emphasis on data as a service, cognitive as a service, you know, major thing for, one of the major things for global technology services, delivery. So cognitive delivery, that's kind of new uh, type of uh, um, business offerings uh, which we need to work on, how to make it truly, you know, um, in one se sense, you know, automated, in another sense, you know, uh, cognitive. And, and deliver to our clients some new value, add-on value compared to what was done up until recently. What do you mean by cognitive delivery? Explain that. Yeah, so, so basically, um, in, in, in plain English, so what's right now happening usually when you have l l large systems, compu uh, computer system, IT system, right, which are basically supporting a lot of industries, a lot of organizations, corporations, right? You know. Um, it's really done like this. So it's uh, people run technology assisted, okay? And um, you know, a lot of decisions, of course, being made by people. Uh, but some of the uh, decisions can be, you know, simpler decisions, right? Uh, decisions which can be automated, can be standardized, normalized, can be done now by technology. Okay, and people going to be used for more complex decisions, right? So basically, you're going to turn from uh, people-run technology-assisted to technology assisted um, um, to technology run people assisted, okay? That's a very different value proposition, right? So again, it's not about eliminating jobs, it's very different. It's taking off, you know, routine and automatable parts of the business, right, to technology and giving options and, uh, you know, basically options to choose for more complex, you know, decision uh, uh, making to people. That's kind of, I would say, uh, the approach. So it's about scale. And as scale well. too, I mean, of course. You know, IBM, a, when, when Gerstner made the decision to sort of reorganize as a services company, you know, IBM came, became a global leader, if not the global leader. But a services business, hard to scale. You can scale with bodies. And the bigger it gets, the more complicated it gets, the more expensive it gets. So you're saying, if I understand it correctly, that IBM is using cognitive and software, <laughs> essentially, to scale its services business where possible assisted by humans. Yeah, that's so th that's exactly uh, the deal. So, and this is very different value proposition to uh, say compared what was happening recently or uh, earlier or with, uh, you know, other, uh, you know, uh, players. We're not building new uh, shiny and much more powerful and cognitive, you know, empowered uh, mousetrap, no. We're trying to become trusted broker, okay? And how to do that at scale, that's an uh, open, interesting question. But we think that this transition from, you know, uh, people around technology assisted to uh, uh, technology around people assisted, that's the, the way to go. So Seth, what, how, what does that mean to you? How does that resonate? Um, yeah, you know, I think um, it brings up a good point, actually. You know, if you think of the whole litany of, you know, the scope of, of analytics. You have everything from kind of describing what happened in the past all the way up to cognitive. Um, and I think you need to understand the power of each of those and what they should and shouldn't be used for. And a lot of people talk, you talk, people talk a lot about predictive analytics, right? And when you hear predictive analytics, that's really where you start doing things that fully automate processes that really enable you to replace decisions that people make, right? I think, but those are more um, transactional type decisions, right, more binary type decisions. As you get into things where you can apply binary, or uh, sorry, where you can apply cognitive, you're moving away from those more binary decisions, um, those more transactional decisions, and you're moving more towards a situation where, yes, the system, the, the, the silicon brain, right, um, is, is, is giving you some advice on the types of decisions that you should make based on the amount of information that it could absorb that you can even fathom absorbing. Um, but there still needs to be some human judgment involved, right? Um, some, some understanding of the, the context outside of what the computer can gain. I think that's really where something like cognitive comes in. And so you talk about, you know, in, in, this, in this move to, to have, you know, computer run human assisted, right? There's a whole lot of descriptive and predictive 
and even prescriptive analytics that are going on before you get to that cognitive decision, but enables the people to make more value-added decisions, right? So really enabling the people to truly add value to what the data and the analytics have said um, instead of thinking about it as replacing people, because you're never going to replace you're never going to replace people. You know, I think I've heard people at some of these conferences talking about, well, you know, cognitive and AI is going to get rid of data scientists. I don't, I don't buy that. I think that's really going to enable data scientists to do more valuable, more incredible things than they could do today. Well, we've we've talked about this a lot, Stu. I mean, machines uh, through the course of history have, have always replaced human tasks, right? And it's all about you know what's next for the human, and and and, and I mean you know, with physical labor, you know, driving stakes or whatever it is, you know, we've seen that. Uh, but now, for the first time ever, you're seeing co cognitive, cognitive assisted, you know, functions come into play. And it's, it's new, it's a new innovation curve. It's not Moore's law anymore that's driving innovation. It's how we interact with systems and cognitive systems. What are people and and, I, and I think, you know, I think you hit on a, on a good point there. Um, when you said in, in driving innovation. Um, you know, I've run, you know, large scale automated processes where the goal was to reduce the number of people involved, right? And those are, like you said, physical tasks that people are doing. What we're talking about here is replacing intellectual tasks, right? Or not replacing, but freeing up the intellectual capacity that is going into solving intellectual tasks to en enable that capacity to focus on more innovative things, right? We can teach a computer to explain a, 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 an area to us or give us some advice on something. I don't know that in the next 10 years we're going to be able to teach a computer to innovate. And if we can free up these smart minds today that are focusing on how do we make a decision to how do we be more innovative in leveraging this decision and applying this decision, that's a huge win. And it's not about replacing that person, it's about freeing their time up to do more valuable things. Do you have a comment? Yes, sure. So, for example, from my uh, previous experience, right, in healthcare. So, uh, physicians right now, uh, uh, you know, basically it's basically impossible for human individuals, right, to keep up with pace of changes and innovations happening in healthcare and, and biomedical areas, right? So, in a few years, it looks like there were some numbers that uh, estimate that in three days, you're going to, uh, you know, have much more information for several years produced during three days what was done by several years prior to that point. So it basically becomes inhuman to keep up with all these innovations, right? Because of that, decisions are going to be not, you know, optimal decisions. So what we'd like to be doing, right, to empower individuals, make this decision more, um, you know, correctly uh, with alternatives, right? That's about empowering people. It's not about just taking which is, can be done through this process of all this information and getting routine stuff out of their plate, which is completely full. There was a stat, I think it was last year at IBM Insight. I don't know if this is exact numbers, but it was something like a physician would have to read 1,500 periodicals a week just to keep up with the, the new data innovations. I mean, that's virtually impossible. impossible. And exactly. so that's something that you're obviously pointing, pointing Watson at. I mean, but there are mundane examples, right? So you go to the airport now, you don't need a, a person, at the, you know, an agent to give you a boarding pass. It's on your phone already, you get there, okay. So that's a, that's that's a mundane example. We're talking about Seth, significantly more complicated things. And so, what's the gate? Is the gate creativity? Is it is it education? You know, because um, these are step functions in value creation. I think you know. I think that's a what the gate is is a question I haven't really thought too much about. I, you know, when I, I approach it, you know, the, the thinking more from a you know, not so much what's the gate, but where where can this add the most value? Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe maybe I have thought about it, and the gate is value, um, and, and and it's value both in terms of, you know, like the physician example where, you know, physicians look at, at images, and I don't I mean I don't even know what the error rate is when someone evaluates an, an MRI or something. I probably I probably don't want to know, <laughs> right? Um, so getting some advice there, the value may not be monetary, but to me, it's a lot more than monetary, right? If I'm a patient, um, and there's a lot of examples like that in, in other places, you know, that that are in in various industries. That I think that's that's the gate. Is what's I the think value? You just hit on it because you are a heat-seeking value missile inside of your organization. Yeah. But what, so, what skill sets do you have? How, where did you come from that you have this capability? Was it your experience, your education, your your fortitude? 
Uh, well, the answer is yes <laughs> um, to, to all of them. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a scientist by training. Uh, my background's in statistical genetics, um, and I've kind of worked through the business. I came up through the R&D organization within Monsanto over the last uh, almost exactly 10 years now. Um, and I've had lots of, of opportunities to, to leverage, um, you know, data and analytics to change how the company operates. Um, and I'm lucky because I'm in a company right now that is extremely science driven, right? Monsanto is a science based company. And so being in a company like that, you don't face to your question about financial industry. I don't think you face the same barriers in Monsanto about using data and analytics in the same way you may in a, in a financial type of company. Based on my experience, 50% of diagnosis being uh, proven incorrect, okay? So 50%. Five zero. Five zero, half. So imagine you go to your physician twice. Once you, on average, you, you get a wrong diagnosis. We don't know which one, by the way. <laughs> so we definitely need some, some like help. As, as, as individuals, as humans, we do need some help as cognitive. And it goes across different industries, right? Technology. So if your server is down, you know, you shouldn't worry about it because there is like system, you know, a robust system enough, right? So think about it, how you can do it at scale and then, you know, start imagining the future which going to be very empowering. So it used to be get a second opinion. And, and now the opinion comprises thousands, millions, maybe tens of millions of opinions. Is that right? It's that's right, exactly. And scale of data accumulation, which is going to help us to solve these problems, is enormous. So we need to keep up with that scale, you know, and do it properly, exactly for business value proposition. Let's talk about the, the role of the CDO and where you see that evolving, how it relates to the role of the CIO. We've had this conversation frequently, but is I'm wondering if the narrative's changing, right? Because it was it's been fuzzy when, when we first met a couple of years ago. That that was still a hot topic. When I first started covering this 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 topic, it was really fuzzy. Has it come in into to more clarity lately in terms of the role of the CDO versus the CIO versus the CTO, that's a Chief Digital Officer? Are we starting to see these roles? Are they, are they more than just sort of buzzwords or gray, you know, areas? I think there's some clarity happening already. So, for example, um, there is much more acceptance for chief data officer, chief analytics officer, chief, chief digital officer, right, in addition to CIO. So basically, the situation is similar to what was with CIOs 20 plus years ago. And CIO role in one sentence, from my viewpoint, would be how you can, uh, using IT, leveraging IT, empower your business value proposition. With CDO, it's the same with data. How using data, leveraging data, your data and your client's data, you can bring new value to your clients and businesses. That's kind of, uh, I would say, differential. Last word. You know, and you think, you know, I'm not a CDO, um, but if you think about the concept of establishing a role like that, I think, I think the name is great because it, what it demonstrates is support from leadership that this is important. And I think even if you don't have the name in the organization, like in, like in Monsanto, you know, we still have that executive management level support to the data and analytics are first class citizens and they're important and we're going to run our business that way. And I think that's really what's important is, are you able to build the culture that enables you to leverage the maximum capability, data and analytics? That's really what matters. All right, we'll leave it there. Seth, Gene, thank you very much for coming to the queue. Really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank All right, you. keep it right there, everybody. Stu and I will be back. This is the IBM Chief Data Officer Summit. We're live from Boston. Be right back. <laughs>